Prudo or Liar's Dice is one of the great games of history. We know that it was played in the 1530s between Atahualpa, one of the last kings of the Inca Empire, and Pizarro, the Spanish conquistador who eventually was responsible for him getting strangled. The game is perfect for giving your students an intuition about probability before they get into all of the nitty-gritty mathematics. Prudo can be easily taught to a grade 5 classroom. If they do have a problem, it tends to be in the bidding. So let's start there. I'm going to give you two different ways to explain the bidding. The first one is with this graph. Here we see that 1, 1 is the lowest bid, so it appears at the bottom. 1, 2 is a little bit higher, so it's the next highest bid. In Prudo, you get to uh, start off with a bid, let's say three fives, and then the next group has to do a bid that is higher than that. So what would be a higher bid? Well, the next highest would be three sixes, then four ones, and four twos. So let's say the next group said four twos. And then the next group has to do a bid even higher. So they could say four threes. And the next group, again, they can say something like five twos. So this keeps on going, this process, until a group says bluff. They don't believe that there are at least five twos uh, out there on the different tables. So that's technique one to explain uh, how the bidding works. Now let's look at my favorite technique and that is to at the very start get the students to say 35. What does a bid of 35 mean? It means that there are at least three fives. 42. There are at least four twos. 43, there are at least four threes. 52, there are at least five twos. So to get them used to this correspondence between the natural numbers and a bid, that really helps them because the natural no numbers are naturally ordered so that they, um, they avoid the um, getting lost in which bid is higher than which other bid. Let's look at a sample game. So here are three groups playing, red, green, and blue. Red is going to start. None of these groups can see each other's dice. So the red group starts, and the red group says 26. There are at least two sixes. Is that true? Well, that's false. So if the green group said bluff right now, the red group would lose a dice. But the green group doesn't know that there aren't two sixes out there. They think, oh, that's not a very high bid. I'm going to say that that might be true. So then the green group comes and they say, well, I think that there are at least three fours because they've got two of them. And in fact, that, that ends up to be true. But the blue group doesn't think that it looks true because they don't have any fours. So they think three fours is a very high bid. So they're going to call bluff. So what happens? Well, the blue group called bluff, and there are at least three fours out there, so the blue group has to lose a dice. There we go. OK, let's do it again. After a group loses a dice, it's the next group that gets to begin the next bluffing round, so the next, the, the next round. So the next round is going to begin with the red group. So again, shuffle, roll the dice, and there we see that the red group has had a very lucky roll. They've had three threes. What a nice roll. So they're going to start off that there are at least four threes out there. Green says, OK, well, I suppose that's reasonable. I'm going to say that there are at least four sixes out there. Now, is that true? No, that, that's definitely not true. But blue, who has a six, is thinking, well, I don't really want to challenge that with a bluff. So I'm going to say, I'm going to use the fact that I know that the red group started with four threes. I'm going to assume that 
the red group has a lot of threes. So here's some of the subtlety of the bidding coming into play. So they are going to bid. There are at least five threes. Now you see that this happens to put the red group in a very awkward position. And the red group is thinking, well, I can't really call bluff on that because I've got three, five, three threes. So I'm going to say that there are at least six threes. And that is too much for the green group. So the green group says bluff. And it is, a, it is incorrect. There are not uh, six threes. So the red group loses a bluff. Keep playing until you only have one group that has any dice left, and that group wins. You can also choose to end it whenever one group loses all its dice. So that group can be the loser, and then all of the other groups win together. Uh, whatever way you, you decide to play, I encourage you not to go out and buy one of the prepackaged games. They typically come with cups to roll the dice in. The kids are quite capable of cupping their own hands to hide the dice, and you save a lot of money, and you can put that money into buying nice, chunky, good quality dice rather than um, into cardboard containers. 45. 45. 45. Hey. The unsolved problem of mathematics is how to play Perudo optimally and to prove that you're playing it optimally. This is not a trivial question. To give your students a feel for just how tough it is, take a step back and just split them into two groups and just give them one dice each and ask them to write down the optimal strategy for bidding for the person who starts out. So for example, if uh, the person who rolled a two here is to bid, what do they bid? They don't know that the other person has rolled a four. What's the optimal way that they should bid? It's not trivial. Enjoy Perudo. Thank you.